I just want to make sure I don't over go, over go my time here because um, the Great Wall is a very long wall and my association with it is fairly long as well. Um, recently celebrated my 60th birthday and realized that I've had a half-life, a very good half-life at the Great Wall of China. It's always in the news and in recent days uh, behind that very uh, well-rehearsed uh, Communist Party Congress, the 19th in China's history, um, behind the Politburo, all the delegates, there's always an image of the Great Wall snaking across the mountains. And when I see that, I'm very critical of it for various reasons. I suppose if I confronted the artist, he'd probably say, well, this is an impression. But in my opinion, the reality makes the impression seem rather poor. And I hope you'll be convinced of that argument this afternoon as I present uh, the Great Wall the way I've see seen it and experienced it in the last 30 years. So I think my presentation has five parts. Uh, in part one, I'll tell you how I got to the Great Wall because I'm British. And in part two, I'm going to tell you how I really began to see the Great Wall in a different way uh, than it had been before seen because, uh, well, as I describe myself today, I'm mainly a geographer quite an archaeologist at heart, I like history, and uh, I see things from different perspectives, not just the China side, but also the outside. Of course, the Great Wall is a two-sided story. Um, and in part three, I'm going to uh, tell you how uh, a fortuitous meeting with another William led to a fantastically rewarding project that influenced the future of the Great Wall, the conservation of the Great Wall. So that's a story of revisiting the Great Wall with uh, the first explorer of the wall and the photographs he took of it more than 80 years before I ever took a photograph of it. Uh, the Great Wall of China uh, is a magical term it's very misleading. I'll focus on this term later. But perhaps the most surprising part of my presentation this afternoon is that I have a Great Wall outside China story to tell. It's been a fascinating part of my research and that's ongoing. And finally, I'm going to round up with uh, an off the wall look at the Great Wall by making a journey to museums, galleries, libraries, farmers homes around the world and selecting objects that tell a very specific part of this monument's massive and sometimes confusing story. And uh, yeah, these are all things I've done in the last 30 years. Uh, and then we have a bit of dessert, as it were, a bit of film. And uh, the feeling that maybe I don't have enough time to do, do, do all I would like to do on this structure. I need a team. I need uh, another generation behind me. And thankfully, uh, I have that. OK, so let's begin. Uh, from Wallasey to the Great Wall. Uh, probably no one has ever heard of uh, Wallasey. Um, Wallasey is a ferry ride across the uh, River Mersey from uh, Liverpool. Uh, you've all heard of Liverpool. Um, and I went to school there and my headmaster was very influential. One of the main reasons I was directed to uh, a life in China. Um, at this point, I usually play the game Spot William Lindsay. Uh, there I am on the back row, third from the right, uh, greedy, uh, clutching all the trophies. 
But this uh, picture has uh, meaning because any research on the Great Wall, at least initially, involves looking at the primary source, the ruins, and they're strewn across North China, across nine provinces, and they constitute the most extensive system of ruins on the planet. Well, uh, I loved the past more than the present and the future when I was a lad. Uh, again, where is William? I'm standing next to the lady in the red hat on the far right. We're standing on top of Liverpool Cathedral and the portly man right there is my headmaster. And he wasn't a teacher. He didn't know really how to keep a classroom of boys and girls uh, entertain, entertained in the classroom for a whole week. So we took us out a lot to castles and cathedrals and farms and factories. And he said, we must have three books by our bedside, a Bible, a prayer book and an atlas. And it's on the map of China that I discovered a symbol, a symbol for the Great Wall. So this was about 1967. And I put my hand up to tell our headmaster, sir, when I grow up, I want to go to China and explore the Great Wall from that end to that end. And he said, wonderful ambition, William. But you know, there's a revolution in China. I had no idea what a revolution was. I just carried on with my life. I had my dream. I loved to run. I studied geography and geology. And uh, the more running I did, the more I realized it was a very good way of connecting me with the wild parts of my country. And um, my country has some national parks and it has some ancient monuments. And one of the most famous ancient monuments is Hadrian's Wall. And in 1987, my brother and I ran along Hadrian's Wall over a weekend and in 1984. And uh, stopping for a chocolate bar and a swig of water, my brother Nick said to me, hey William, you should go to China and do the same thing on the Great Wall. It was a perfectly timed suggestion. The revolution was over. Mao Zedong had died in 1976. Deng Xiaoping, the great reformer, had opened China's door since 1978. In the early 80s, I'd heard of people going to China and very importantly, I'd heard that they returned home afterwards. <laughs> so I conceived a plan. I would devote one or two years of my life to make a journey on foot along the Great Wall. And it seemed to have a definite start and a definite finish. I mean, it started in the interior and it snaked across the north through the brown and the yellow bits of the mountains and the desert, and it reached the Yellow Sea, which seemed to be a clear finishing line, at which point I hopefully would go home and resume my life probably teaching, because at this point I had spent three years in the oil field, decided that wasn't for me, and returned to study in Manchester. So that was the plan. Oh, the other two perfect things I should mention here. Uh, aged 27, 28, no loves or loans to hold me back. So I could cut free and come over to China. Well, I got great help in those early days. Everyone I wrote to, every company uh, I approached was enthusiastic and they sent me their shoes, their clothing, and even their money. And as I arrived here in uh, Japan for the first time, I was thinking to myself, hmm, those ASIC shoes I got 30 years ago, they served me well. This is the first success in sponsorship I got for my journey. And rather appropriately, that's the wall on the front cover. Back in the 80s, researching my journey, there weren't many images of the Great Wall, but the ones I saw, I noticed, 
The wall was very steep. There weren't many people on it. And there were no villages nearby, which really posed questions in my mind how I was going to survive. Well, I felt quite confident in my athletic ability. I was running morning, noon and night. I was typically running 100 miles, that's 160 kilometers a week, week after week, month after month. But I felt as though this only wasn't only going to be a physical challenge, but it was going to be a psychological challenge and maybe a political challenge as well. Well, I uh, told the local paper what the grand plan was, and of course I had to work for the sponsors, and they cooked up a uh, news feature on the eve of the year of the tiger. William goes to Chinatown, Europe's oldest uh, Chinatown, and uh, Mr. Zhou, the most famous restaurateur, though, will teach William how to use chopsticks and how to introduce himself in Chinese. It all worked very, very well, but I would soon learn in Tiananmen Square when I flexed my Cantonese on these northerners, they all laughed. They, of course, spoke Mandarin. This is one of my favorite early photographs of my uh, arrival in China. Um, the amazing thing is you can go back to this very spot today and take the same photograph and there would probably be 200 cars in the view. There would probably be some, uh, actually, if you go there now, because it's on the main avenue quite close to Tiananmen Square, the, uh, the Mao, Chairman Mao quotation up there is probably a Communist Party uh, 19th Congress billboard. So maybe things haven't changed as much as we think they have. Okay, well, I was over there to do a job. Uh, it's a long story, my journey along the wall in 1986, at the time, seemed a failure. I ran into all kinds of trouble. Uh, number one, I hadn't done my homework on the climate very well. I found myself setting off when temperatures were in the mid-30s, and uh, it was just impossible to... Uh, travel more than 15 kilometers a day without feeling exhausted. Uh, I was staying with farmers. That was my plan. It worked pretty well. Another of those Spot William challenges for you. Uh, people are amazed that in 1986, uh, a foreigner could go to China and knock on the doors of farmers living close to the wall and receive hospitality. Actually, it was very tough. Uh, first of all, most of these families I would meet had never seen a foreigner in their lives before. Um, they didn't know what I was doing. Uh, they stared at me. Uh, they questioned me. But with patience, smiling, and sign language, I knew, I realized I could get the food, water, and shelter I needed to sustain me on the journey. But after a couple of weeks, my body let me down. Uh, I came down with amoebic dysentery. I'd been limping for a few days, and that turned out to be a stress fracture in the foot. I had to abort the journey, but that was difficult. I was in the middle of nowhere. The farmers took me to a clinic, and after lying in a clinic for a day, I remember opening my eyes, and there were a lot of suited men. Uh, they were policemen, and they had an English teacher with them who interpreted, and he said, we heard a foreigner was ill. Well, to cut this very long story short, they hoiked me into town, gave me some emergency medical treatment, and told me, you're a foreigner, and did, don't you know most of China is closed to foreigners? 
Okay, well, that was the end of my 1986 journey. But I learned what was necessary for a successful journey. Number one, although this was a big communist country, I had realized ordinary people were pretty welcoming if I was patient. Number two, I realized that even if I met the police, they were quite friendly. And thirdly, I realized if I didn't do it there and then, my legs were not going to be two and a half hour marathon legs in five or 10 or 20 years time. I couldn't wait until China opened fully to the outside world. A uh, bit of background here. Back in the 80s, there were 325 places open to foreigners in China. They were pinpricks on the big map. About 99.9% .9 of the territory was closed. Um, the police at the time seemed a great barrier. But although they have the Great Wall on their uh, insignia and on their, um, you know, everything, in fact, they tend not to be standing up on the wall. Um, there were a few signs up, but these were usually on the edge of big cities. So my philosophy of trespass was, it's either now or never. The people welcomed me, so I went out there to do it. We now move to the 1987 story of William. So 1986, my China apprenticeship is behind me and I'm back in China for another go. And I decide to divide my journey into two parts, the spring and the autumn. Um, I think at this point, it's good to give you the data of my journey. 2,500 kilometers on foot following the ruins of the Great Wall. 78 days on the run. 60 evenings spent hosted by herders and farmers very close to the wall. Sounds a bit of a foot slog, doesn't it? Well, we can definitely ramp it up because on the way I was stopped and say arrested by the police nine times. I was deported once. I used two passports and I made three marriage proposals to the same girl. So I had a great physical, political and romantic adventure and eventually ended my journey here where the Great War meets the sea. So this is the place I had perceived would be the finishing line from where I would go back to Britain, uh, get a nice job, maybe in the Department of Geography at a university, meet a beautiful girl, buy a house, sports car, and live happily ever after. Well, it all went beautifully wrong, uh, as told in my first book, Alone on the Great Wall because I met my wife-to-be, who's with me in the audience here. Thank you. And a lot of what comes from now on is due to her vision, her diplomacy, and just her smartness. So uh, we've since uh, spent most of our lives in China, because as I stood where I thought the wall ended, at that point, I was beginning to realize what this really is. So, well, this is what our family looked like 10 years ago. Uh, the boys on the right have almost doubled in size. The lad in the white t-shirt and the little lad in the red shirt, they've become budding filmmakers. Uh, they've had a feature on their Great Wall film uh, run on BBC News. Uh, 
Let's hope it's not fake news, hey? I don't think you can fake the kind of footage we're going to show you at the end of this presentation. But behind me is the wall, and you're probably thinking, oh, it's not in the mountains. Oh, it doesn't look as though it's made of stone and brick. No, the Great Wall is probably very different than what you think it is. And uh, maybe uh, I should tell you a few, few things about it now. I had made a journey along the Great Wall as the world knows it today. So that's the Great Wall you will see on a map of China. Or if you've uh, made a good purchase of a globe or a world map, you will notice the wall on that map. That's the most recent of China's Great Walls. Uh, it was built during the Ming Dynasty, and I suppose most of you don't know your Chinese dynasties very well. You know, Ding Dong, Ting Tang, Ping Pong, whatever. Uh, this is the Ming Wall. It's the wall, the Big Daddy, that was constructed to stop another Genghis Khan type invasion of China. Okay. But before this Ming Wall, there were 15 other Great Walls of China. In other words, solid barriers of stone or earth uh, uh, that ran for extraordinary lengths along the northern frontiers of ancient Chinese dynasties. And the earliest dates from round about 300 BC. If I had a blank map of China, the outline map of China, it looks a bit like a rooster, and a set of colored pens, I could draw on those lines of those walls, the 16 great walls of China. And you'd notice they're all at the top of the map. They all have a west to east orientation. Uh, some are very long. Those are built by the big dynasties that had big empires, and some are a bit shorter. Uh, you might say, oh, you've made a mistake there because that line goes over the border. Uh, well, actually not, because the outline map is, remember, today's PRC. And in ancient times, for most of history, there were not absolute borders. So we have the prospect of Great Wall being outside China. And that's one of my stories coming up. Okay, so that's me and Tommy standing on the wall uh, about 10 years ago. And also 10 years ago, we took the opportunity to revisit some of the people who helped me uh, back in 1987. Uh, gentlemen, lady here, they're my patron saints of hospitality in China uh, because I've been back to see them three or four times. I've seen how they've become wealthier under China's reforms, how they've moved from the edge of the desert, uh, where I stayed with them in April 1987, into a booming, gleaming, white-colored oasis on the Silk Road that's being rejuvenated as a modern trade route, uh, communications route across Asia. And remember the two cute kids slurping rice that you saw a while back? Their mum and dad. I've even seen the children, who are now 37 and 39. Well, those are my friends from 1987, and there's my foe from 1987. But actually, I realize although he was a foe, he was actually a friend. I don't know about you, but have you ever been in a situation where you're very close to losing something? It's very easy to think, well, if I just forget this and move on to something else, that's the easy option. I would have done that, trudging along the wall in 1987, lonely, tired, filthy, no communication with my family for seven or eight weeks. It would have been very easy to say, I want out. But those nine times, the police, this man and his colleagues, stood in front of me, threatening to take my dream away. It's at that time 
I asked myself the question, William Lindsay, do you really want to do this? And my answer was yes, I wanted to do it. The police, the barriers were part of my success. They played a major part in helping me along the Great War. And this comes to my amnesty, as it were, um, because, yeah, it's very surprising to many people that someone can do all that, uh, break the law so much in China in the 80s, but decades later can be, well, a permanent resident of China, the recipient of every award that the Chinese government, national, provincial, local, can offer me. And that's because I think I have become not only a presenter of the Great Wall story, but a protectionist along the way. In the early years, my disadvantage was being a foreigner. But in the 1990s, as I saw the Great Wall being, uh, well, in tourist areas at least, becoming rather a, a dumping ground for litter, and I was shocked by the graffiti, I stood up and I started to say, you know, how can this be so? If Chinese people do this to their Great Wall, what hope does the ordinary land in these provinces have if the national icon, the great work of their ancestors, is treated so? And for that straight talk, I've been rewarded. Okay, so I've made my journey along the Great Wall in 1987. It's an historic journey. It's the first journey on foot by a foreigner. And my wife and I are back in China. Uh, one major plan has gone wrong. We thought that my hard-won knowledge about the Great Wall would be the basis of our future life. You know? Taking people to the Great Wall near Beijing, taking people along the wall, seemed like a good plan. But then 1989 happened, and suddenly China was not one of the world's top destinations. But in the 1990s, I worked as a teacher, as a uh, features editor at China Daily, and at the State News Agency. And for much of this time, I was based in Beijing. And there I am on my bike on the way to the Great Wall. So in 1987, as I trekked along the wall, I'm always looking behind. I've got to make you know, 40 kilometers on average a day in the, uh, uh, on that journey. I don't really understand what I'm seeing when I look back. But in the 90s, I'm going to the wall every weekend and I'm uh, writing down my ideas. I'm going back to Beijing. I'm contacting Chinese Great Wall experts to see what they think. Uh, I'm taking note of all the outstanding architecture and archaeology of the wall in the Beijing region. In the Beijing region, is a big chunk of the Great Wall story. Um, it's about the size of New Jersey, about the size of Wales, Tasmania, Schleswig-Holstein in Germany, and it has 388 kilometers of Great Wall. And I saw it for about 35 weekends a year, and as I saw it, I began to think about what it actually was. And as a geographer, and as someone who likes to take photographs, I realized that the true majesty of the war is a combination of the building and the backdrop. And when I went to those sections of war the tourists go to, well, I got a different feeling. In fact, I was working at China Daily um, at that time, and uh, one Monday morning, 
in the newsroom, as colleagues do. Someone said, William, what did you do at the weekend? And I said, oh, I went to the Great Wall. And one of my colleagues said, oh, William, you should be careful. Your wife will become a Great Wall widow. Uh, and it made me think uh, a little bit about incorporating her in my, my great passion. Um, but anyway, I said, well, actually, I, I don't go to this tourist wall. I go to parts of the wall that are usually very quiet. And I took in photographs like this. And then people gathered around and they said, oh, that's not the Great Wall that we know. I said, oh, you, you're talking about the tourist wall. Yeah, Bad Aling tourist wall, you know, where Richard Nixon went in 1972. And yeah, gets about seven or eight million a year. I said, no, I don't go there. I go to this wall. This wall is a wilderness. It's wild wall. Little did I know at that time, I'd introduced a new word, a new term into uh, what is emerging as Great Wall Studies. Wild Wall describes the thousands of kilometers of Great Wall that's become a wilderness. Because, as I said earlier, this is the Ming Wall. Uh, it was built roughly between, well, exactly, between 1368 and 1644. And after 1644, it was abandoned. And nature claimed it. Dust blew from the north and uh, seeds in bird droppings on the wind has colonized the surface of the wall and it's become a wilderness, and a very beautiful one. Um, at this time also, I began to look at how the wall was being protected because this is a spectacular viewpoint and it's at this viewpoint that I realized every time I returned there, all these film boxes, Kodak Fuji film boxes, sausage wrappers, Coke cans. I began to think, hmm, as more people come out to the wall, this outdoor museum is going to need some protecting. That's a nice shot because it shows you, you know, how the surface of the wall has been claimed by nature. A um, bit of background to that. People are always asking, why did the Great Wall become abandoned? Well, it became abandoned because the Ming Dynasty fell. And the Ming Dynasty fell to outsiders, Manchu people. And Manchu people were very good at understanding steppe politics. And what steppe politics got to do with it? Okay, this is where uh, the geographer weighs in. You know, I'm introduced as William Lindsay, man who's traveled along the Great Wall of China, historian. I say, no, 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 I've not studied history since the age of 15. But I do emphasize the Great Wall story is rooted in geography, rooted in geography. It's the story of a conflict between adjacent societies in Northeast Asia. The China story is one of uh, good land, rainfall, sunshine, long growing season, organization, lots of people coming together, working together, make farming, making farming safe behind, beside the great river of China, the Yellow River, the cradle of Chinese civilization. And this action of coming together creates surpluses, stability, that allows people to do other things rather than just grow food. They produce all kinds of utilities and beautiful objects. And this is the China civilization story. Because the land is good. Low latitude, low altitude, not far from the sea, and so on. But north of China, past that emerald green of the North China Plain, you get to the yellow brown bits north of Beijing, you cross the Gobi Desert to the green bits of today's Mongolia. The lifestyle uh, of the people, uh, the nomadic people, was very different because their land was high altitude, latitude, further from the sea. And most importantly, the earth was put there by the wind, infertile. The low, the very short growing season uh, made the growth of crops 
almost impossible. So people naturally arrived on those landscapes as hunters and then became herders, which was a very good way of life until a drought or a catastrophic winter struck. And on those occasions, uh, people only had one option to survive. They traveled south, a journey of survival, and they eventually trespassed on Chinese land. And the Chinese uh, realized that to engage these nomadic people who rode horses and uh, used the bow and arrow from horseback so uh, wonderfully was a disaster for them. They couldn't compete, even when they trained their own cavalry. So they did what they could do. They built walls. They had been building circular enclosing walls around their towns and cities at least for 2,000 years at that time. Uh, and they would soon create, invent uh, long walls, great walls to defend their land from nomadic invasion. So uh, here I am exploring the wall in the Beijing region and formulating my theory of wild wall and uh, why it needs protecting and uh, it should be not only the building that needs protecting but also the land beside the building because that's where the builders lived, it's where they uh, sourced and manufactured the building materials for the defense. Okay, so uh, in uh, 1989, I published my first book, uh, Alone on the Great Wall, and uh, it didn't sell well initially. Uh, my publisher sent me on a uh, book tour to boost sales, and eventually this lady heard me speaking, and she sent me that very nice letter. You can probably read it. Um, I have a book called The Great Wall of China, a very impressive account written by an American, published 1909. Perhaps it's too late to be of use, but I gladly send you the book. So the book she's referring to, The Great Wall of China, was written by William Guile, uh, who I nicknamed William the Conqueror, and there's William II over there. So we both made journeys along the wall. Um, it's William Gile's book, 1909, William Lindsay's book, 1987. And we met at this place where we both took photos. And as I opened William Gile's book, the package, yeah, at first, a bit of a sigh of disappointment. You know, someone had been there before me. Uh, but then a quick realization we were kindred spirits. And I felt as though we not only had a love for the Great War, we not only shared the same names, but we were both guided there by geography. Because William Gile's book begins with the magical line, there is a Great Wall of China, so the geographies tell us. But they do not make it clear whether it's made of stone or of China, how long it is or how long it has been. How long it has been seems to be a very poignant and humorous part of the introduction. But actually, it's a bit tragic. They're the same place, 79 years apart, and you can see the tower, the watchtower. These are the places that made the wall work because those are the places where the soldiers were garrisoned. Tower's gone. And I thought, oh, old photos are so valuable. They allow us to see a wall that's no longer there. And I collected old photographs madly. And eventually, in 2003, I set off on my second great journey along the wall, uh, not alone, but with William Guile and some other early visitors. And our aim was to work together to re-photograph the wall. And the purpose wasn't just to show the wall had changed. The purpose was to show China that the wall has changed a lot. 
and what the wall is going to be like in the future depends on what you, Chinese people, government, Great Wall community, do now. So it was an amazing journey that began in 90, uh, 2003, and it took me along mainly the Ming Wall, and I saw sections of wall that were rebuilt, sections of wall that had changed little. And at this point, uh, this very long journey and difficult journey to find exactly these locations where the old photos were taken was looking to be at least three to five years in duration. Uh, I managed to get some assistance from a multinational, but the multinational was concerned that the work wouldn't be too palatable uh, for the Chinese because some of the change might be blamed on, well, you know, wanton destruction during these crazy revolutionary periods like the Great Leap Forward or the Cultural Re Revolution. So we had to have a test exhibition. And luckily, the British ambassador cleared his furniture out of his residence for an evening and we had an exhibition here and we invited some Chinese officials to take a look and they were absolutely amazed by the formula of re-photography in making people easily realize that the Great Wall needs protecting. So this is I think the first thank you to my wife for her diplomacy in getting the Chinese officials here uh, to uh, give their support to, uh, well, shall it was, to, to continue with their support of my project. So uh, I believe you're going to have a uh, re-photography workshop on Sunday. And we just had a great presentation um, from uh, our friend in Kyoto. Uh, I'm sure he likes some of these pictures. This is a, a, a magic lantern slide uh, by William Guile, and it shows where the Great Wall meets the Yellow Sea. And that was from 1908. Uh, and that's what it looks like today. Uh, the color pictures are magic lantern slides, yeah, they're, they're colored. Um, this shows us how Guile traveled. He actually traveled uh, by mule and camel and horse. An amazing journey. He was from Doylestown in Pennsylvania, by the way. And uh, he made uh, one big journey in China before the Great Wall. That was along the Yangtze River. And then for some reason, he switched to the Great Wall. There is a line somewhere in his writing that goes uh, along the lines of, We've learned a lot from the classical world and the Middle East, uh, and uh, we've neglected the Far East, so he went to China. And of all the photographs he took that really show us how the Great Wall has changed, this one is the tops or, well, the trough. Uh, a procession of wonderful towers in 1908, all gone by the time I got there. Uh, in other places, the changes are quite minor. The work was incredibly difficult. There are many re-photography publications on uh, bookshelves around the world, and the photographers in Paris or New York will tell you how difficult it was to get the angle right because, you know, you had to stand in the middle of a highway. Yeah, 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 I can appreciate that. But I don't think any of their tasks were as difficult as finding these locations along the wall. The Ming Wall, remember that's wall number 16, the Ming Wall alone was surveyed and recently found to have been 8,851 kilometers long. Probably 30% 30, uh, 30 has totally disappeared. Another 30% is pretty derelict, a very faint landscape feature. 
and the other 40 is pretty good. But any spot you go to is potentially, you know, two uh, views, uh, views in different seasons, uh, views at different times of the day, added to the difficulty of the work. But, um, yeah, it's great detective work. And when you find a location, you feel so thrilled to deliver the update to the people. And delivering, delivering the update to the people meant the Chinese people. And I'm very proud um, to have achieved this on behalf of William Guile, because this book is the first book about the Great Wall of China, written and illustrated by foreigners, published in China, in Chinese, uh, so that's quite an achievement. Um, we not only had a book out, but we had a, uh, uh, an, an exhibition. Uh, and all the way along our journey, I wondered why William Guile wasn't an exploration hero in the US. And eventually I got an email from Tim Adamski from Doylestown. And he said, I found a lot of materials in metal boxes uh, uh, that have come to light after a great collector in, in the district died. And the first box I've looked into is full of great war materials belonging to William Guile. And I Googled you, William Guile, um, Googled the Great Wall and William, and William Guile, and found hundreds of stories telling me what you two have been uh, doing on the Great Wall. And this is uh, some of the treasure I viewed when I made a journey a couple of months later to Doylestown in Pennsylvania. Really getting to the nitty gritty of the journey. There's even a bill for a certain section of his journey to pay the mules and the men and even a little tip. And uh, finding all these materials allowed me to fill in all the gaps. Of course, there's a great narrative in William Gar's book, but between such a place and such a place, it wasn't so clear where he'd been, but papers like this that show the uh, old Wade Giles transliteration of the Chinese characters and then the distance in Li, that's a Chinese unit of measurements, and the, even the dates he was there were really uh, great gap fillers uh, to make William Giles historic journey much clearer to us all. And there's the man himself, a very rare picture uh, showing that maybe he traveled uh, exactly in the style that I did, relying on the hospitality of people beside the wall. Uh, he recorded his journey both in handwriting and uh, as a blog almost in these Great Wall letters, which he uh, wrote uh, as he traveled along the wall. Uh, he used a typewriter, I think it's a Blickensdorfer number six, which we'll see in a moment. And uh, he sent one copy of the letters back to the US and kept a copy for himself. Yeah, there's the typewriter. Going forward still. Yeah. And when he got to the end of his journey, um, he was given a banquet by the local officials. He even recorded what the banquet consisted of. There's the Kung Pao chicken, there's the Babao fan, yeah, and there's even sea cucumber there. And I think Guile makes a note elsewhere, he was rather reluctant to sample the sea cucumber in a location that was 1500 miles from the sea. Um, Really, the beauty of this story is the way it's linked the recent past with the future of the war. And also, I hope, as the story becomes more well known, how the US and China actually have a great uh, and important piece of common ground. 
uh, I always really wanted to uh, recommend that uh, if an American president was to meet uh, the president of China, a very, very welcome gift would be an original copy of William Giles' The Great Wall of China, maybe signed by one of his grandsons. Well, uh, during my trip to Dawestown, uh, I realized that William Guile lay in a grave, a uh, very nice plot, but passing this tombstone, no one knew what this man had achieved. And I really wanted to put some meaning to that dash. So I had a bronze plaque made, and people now know that William Guile lies there, and he made the first journey along the Great Wall of China in history. Okay, so we now move on to uh, perhaps the most fascinating geographical story uh, within my Great Wall history, and that's Great Wall Outside China. And it begins again with a map. An Aussie friend gives me the Genghis Khan Atlas, and I begin to see how Genghis Khan, uh, uh, his life, was dominated by journeys to retrieve horses that were stolen, wife that was stolen. Uh, and on the map of Mongolia, I realized there were some walls. And the walls were not called Wall of China. They were called Walls of Genghis Khan. So uh, down here in the lower part of the map, the lower right there, you can see some wall below the purple line. That's Wall in China. And you can see it crossing over to Mongolia at like a 10 o'clock orientation. And it seems by what I call the jigsaw theory that these two walls match up. And uh, we all know in China that's Han Dynasty wall in China, built 2,000 years ago. So surely that must be Han Dynasty wall over in Mongolia. I'd ask friends for pictures of the so-called uh, Genghis Khan wall in Mongolia. And they sent me these. Nothing really to get too excited about. But so uh, Google Earth showed a line crossing the Gobi, screen after screen after screen, and a few short sections showed a shadow. The shadow indicated height. So I decided to go there. The journey to the Genghis Khan War. Genghis Khan, by the way, 1162 to 1227. And uh, there's our Genghis Khan expedition crew. My son, Jimmy, has done a bit of growing on the left. And those are our land cruisers. We take the road south, not much traffic, easy to find a campsite, very few visitors. And we stock up on the three essential liquids, water, gasoline, and vodka. Uh, we don't expect to meet many people in this part of the Gobi Desert. But because it's close to the China border, we've had to request access through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who've told us we should head for a specific GPS location where the army will meet us. Sounds very dubious. Is it going to work? Thankfully, we have Professor Bassan with us, who studied the, the deserts of Mongolia and knows this area quite well. We head south, and we reach the Genghis Khan Wall, where that mound of sand and the branches. And about a kilometer away, the next morning, this is what the structure looks like. It looks rather like Han Dynasty Wall I'd seen in China. You can see how close to the border I am there. I am very excited to think if I take home a little piece of this wall, well, the branches, I can have those organic uh, pieces analyzed and radiocarbon-14 dated. And I also find a bit of rope to show us, hopefully, when, this, uh, when these branches were cut. The branches come from a very robust desert shrub called Saxel. So we, fire, we found the wall, we've got our samples, and we've just got to get out alive. There's not much evidence of life in this Gobi Desert. I think on the whole four and a half days in the 
part of the Gobi, we saw this birdie and rhubarb, which is native to the desert. And we also discovered that the wall looks a bit different according to the terrain it crosses. Most of it is this very low mound, but there are a few uh, extinct volcanoes puncturing the uh, desert scene. And at these places, the wall is made of a volcanic rock, basalt. And it's from the top here, I thought to myself, yes, this is very Chinese, occupying the high ground, and waiting for the enemy to, to approach. But as I looked around and realized we were in the middle of nowhere, my next wish was not really to discover anything new, but it was to get back to the familiar. And uh, we met up with our army friends, and they took us to the border, and we had a cup of friendship vodka, which I was dreading because the Chinese habit is to drink one after another after another, but the Mongolian uh, protocol is to have one drink and then they don't offer you any more. Probably so they can have a little bit more themselves. So there I am on my way back to Beijing and I expect my story in the uh, Chinese edition of National Geographic magazine to tell us what we already know. Han Dynasty Great Wall on one side of the border and really Great Wall outside China built in the Han Dynasty, now in today's Mongolia. But in fact, the radiocarbon-14 dating came back with surprise results. That wood was not cut 2,100 years ago. It was only cut during the 11th and 12th centuries. So that put the cat amongst the pigeons. A little bit of historical geography homework and delving in the histories allowed me to come up with a theory that it was built by a dynasty called the Western Xian. So actually that journey led to me evidencing the existence of a previously unknown Great Wall of China or outside China. Another Genghis Khan wall expedition in later years took us to a very different landscape, the steppe. And the steppe has a low mound crossing it, which can hardly be seen in the broad light of day. And it's this wall that may have a nomadic theory behind its construction. And that theory is it was built as a barrier to stop the gazelle migrating off the steppe. Okay, well, uh, I didn't get to my last, uh, most recent uh, project, looking at objects to tell the Great Wall story, but it's always good to leave something for later. So to finish off with, uh, as I promised, a bit of dessert. We're going to, uh, well, I'll ask uh, 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 for a little bit of help to find the, uh, the short video. And uh, in three minutes, you can get a view of the Great Wall that I dreamed of as I trudged along the wall over those 2,700 days. And it shows China is changing because this is what we did last year. We saw the Great Wall from a very unusual angle. Thank you. I've often lay down to rest, looking up at clouds or a gliding hawk, and imagined their views. Since 1986, I've walked the Great Walls of China for 2,500 days. To mark my 30th year in China, my family is embarking on a new, dreamlike journey of discovery. En route, my sons, James and Thomas, will fly. 
to give me a bird's eye view of the Great Wall that, without doubt, is the greatest of views. Thank you for your attention and uh, good luck with all your own research. Thank you.